Lenora, his wife, supported him while he went to Louisiana. She worked while he was in school, preacher school at Louisiana. And I wouldn't embarrass anybody for nothing, but um, I failed to mention because I was just ad-libbing. I, I didn't have anything wrote down and it just, just hit me. Well, it hit me later. You know how you are. You always think of something later. I said, man, I wish I'd have said this. Well, I'm going to say it now. Those of you that um, supported Rick through that school, and, they, and you know who you are. You're the, you're the people that still support whoever needs um, you invested in a life that's well lived when you invested in my brother. And praise the Lord. And God, God will give you the glory. God, the glory goes to God, but it goes to God through you being obedient to his desire and his will. Um, real quickly, because I did not, I thought about it, but I didn't, I didn't do like Paul and Glenda, whoever done their card. But I do want to thank um, Rick and Kathy, I just behind the scenes, just kept kept working through all this. Bob done a Bob done what Second Timothy four two says: preach the word. Bob preached the word yesterday, brothers and sisters, and if you was there, you you heard that. And I have uh, I have family members, and I know you do too, that I love dearly. But Rick's desire, my desire. I'm sure all your desires that your family's with you in heaven. And uh, so some of them, I'm sure, were sitting there screaming and uncomfortable. And Bob said, I hope God weighs heavy on your heart till you do something about it. And I prayed that same prayer last night. Um, they may be uncomfortable. They may not <laughs> want to be around me as much, but uh, I'd rather them be uncomfortable here than burn in hell forever. So it's a reminder to all of us, and especially me, that we need to be about doing the Lord's work. We've uh, we've got us we've got outlined to uh, to do some things this year, good Lord willing, and uh, you know we need to step up to the plate. If we don't, if we're just pew packers, no no offense, but if we're just pew packers. We might as well be out fishing or golfing today, people. I'm sorry. Uh, again, Ron, he done a wonderful job on a song, one song that just I, I didn't know. I sung it a time or two because of Rick, but I didn't know. But he done a wonderful job. Besides that, every time I called him, had to have him come up here and unlock the door that morning because uh, I'd failed to let anybody know anything and move things around and things like that. And so Ron and, and all those that helped Ron, and I didn't catch everybody's names, but I thank you. I thank you. Um, finally, Steve and Michelle, we got back here yesterday evening, I don't know, six or so, and Ron and them had done quite a bit, and Steve and Michelle were still finishing up doing the final touches, so this was back in in somewhat of an order service today. So I thank you, the bottom of my heart, and I know Mary does the same. Just keep us and, and all those others, all on, and Bonnie's family and all those others lost loved ones. This is a family, and this is how we show each other that we don't only look after our own interests, we look after the others. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy Father, Lord, you, you brought us to mindfulness, at least in my life, again this week, Father, that how great and precious are your promises. Father, remind me and remind all of us that life is but a vapor. We're here one second. And whether it's in 
car crash or get knocked off a fence or something goes along with our earthly bodies, we're just gone. Father, knowing that, we also understand and realize Hebrew 9, 27 tells us he's appointed for men to die once and then the judgment. Father, you have made it where we have the opportunity, our loved ones have the opportunity, Father, to not fear that death. But we miss our loved ones. We wouldn't want them back here for nothing and they wouldn't be wanting to come back. They've got their earth, they've got their heavenly reward. Father, they are so blessed that, and we're so blessed that you, you and your son loved us enough that he died on that cross. He shed his blood that we might have remission of our sins. Father, we understand that we're weak and Unfortunately, we still sin, even as Christians. But you've made provisions through your son's blood that if we repent and we confess our faults to one another, that we may be healed. And I think that, I know that's for physical as well as spiritual healing. And Father, it's it's when we do fall short, and, and I understand that, that we just strive to always do better. We strive to persevere, Father, knowing that the testing of our faith. Listen to your servant James wrote us, counted all joy, because it was there as trials, Father, it helped us to reach perfection and completeness and strive for them to do your will. Father, please continue with the families and loved ones of those dearly departed. Father, please continue with Leon and Charlotte. Father, those others that's on prayer list or may not may need to be on a prayer list. Father, especially those spiritually lost. Father, help us to be about doing your will Father, knowing that if any of us lose a loved one unexpected like this, there's so much consolation in your son that we have assurance where they can be. And, and the opposite is just equally as true. Father, we, we can't even imagine how horrible hell's going to be as we can't imagine how glorious heaven's gonna be. We just know we need to be right with you. Again, please forgive us our sins and our shortcomings, strengthen us through your word and through prayer, leaning on each other, growing in fellowship. Ask it all in Jesus' holy name, amen. First song this morning, number 375. 375, we'll sing the entire song. Oh, the depth and the riches of God's saving grace, flowing down from the cross for me. There are the dead for my sins by the Savior was made. In his suffering of Calvary. Oh, the depth of such wonderful love, flowing boundless and full and free. And the death for my sinful soul paid in his suffering of Calvary. How my heart and me bows in his presence today. When I think of his agony, 
By his stripes I am freed from the bondage of sin, through the suffering of Calvary. Oh, the depth of such wonderful love, flowing boundless and full and free. And the death for my sins was all paid in his suffering of Calvary. Oh, what marvelous mercy, what infinite love, what immeasurable grace I see. By his blood I am cleansed, I am happy and free through his suffering of Calvary. Oh, the depth of such wonderful love, flowing boundless and full and free. And the death for my sins was okay, in his suffering on Calvary. Song number 349. After this song, we'll have the Lord's Supper. The entire song, 349. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him to the streets in shame. They sped upon the Savior, so pure and free from sin. They said, Crucify in peace to pray. He could have called his thousand angels to destroy the world and set him free. Precious head, they placed a crown of thorns. They left and set before the king. They struck him and they cursed him and mocked his holy name. All alone he suffered everything. He could have gone. Destroy the world and set him free. He could have called ten thousand angels, they died alone for you and me. When they nailed him to the cross, his brother stood nearby. He said, Woman, behold thy son. He cried, I thirst for water, but they gave him none to drink. Then the sinful work of man was done. He could have called. Destroy the world and set him free. He could have called ten thousand angels. They died alone for you and me. To the hell and my be yielded. He did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone. And when he cried his finish, he gave himself to die. Salvation wondrous land was done. He could have called him down. To destroy the world and set him 
As it is each and every first day of the week, we have the opportunity now to gather around this table of remembrance. I would be remiss to be mindful that this week carries with it a very special week. From the standpoint, it does mark the day that we know that probably Christ would have risen. We know that based on the lunar calendar. We know that Passover observed and was observed about a week ago starting. And we know that through Scripture that we're told that on Thursday night he met with his twelve and established this very table of remembrance, asking them to remember him. We know immediately after that supper he went and prayed and it was like sweat drops of blood from his brow as he knew his death was upon him. As he left that prayer time and he was met then with his betrayal. He was then met with the chief priests who declared him and wanted him to die. And they passed him on to Pilate. And Pilate, not finding anything wrong with him, being an innocent man, still yet released him to the people who, as we just sang the words of the song, they wanted to crucify him. It would have been Friday that he was then taken and taken to the cross and nailed to it, suffering alone, everybody turning themselves away from him. The lone soldier piercing his side and blood pouring from it, he died. Then being buried that same day, he was locked in that burial but it would have been Sunday then, three days later, that he was resurrected. As we remember at this time, his resurrection, that is what has given us life. It is through his death, his innocence, he was the lamb that went and did some very significant things in terms of remitting our sins. And as we ponder and think about the significance of a death that has forever changed the world, that we can look to and call Him our Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, that we can look to Him, how can we not but think and remember Him each and every single first day of the week that we have, just like they did in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, just like they did the first Christians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 and following. Each and every time that we are able to do this, it's the least that we can do to remember what He's done for us. So these emblems, as we take them, let's remember that His body was given. His blood was cleansing for us. And let's remember that and let's place our minds at the scene of the cross now as we partake of the bread and let's have a blessing for that. Father in heaven, we're so thankful, Father, for this bread, which is an emblem of Christ's body that was nailed to the cross for our sins. We pray, Father, we simply pray that we would take it in a way that's pleasing to you at this time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Father in heaven, we thank thee, Father, for another beautiful Lord's day you've allowed us on this earth, Father. We thank thee, Father, for this fruit of the vine that represents your son's blood that was shed for us so that we can have the hope of eternal life, Father. We pray, Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine that is done in a 
manner that's well pleasing in, unto thee. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. At this time, as a separate act of worship, we'll take up a collection. Pray with me, please. Most graceful Heavenly Father, we come to you again to thank you for sacrifice and for all the many blessings that you've given us. At this time, as we give back a portion to you, we pray that we give from our hearts. And if you'll accept it in a pleasing way to you. Lord, we love you. Precious Holy Name, we pray. Amen. Song number 801, 801, after this song we'll have a prayer. Once I stood in the night with my head bowed low in the darkness as black as could be. And my heart felt alone, and I cried, the oh Lord, don't hide your face from me. Oh, my hands all the way, every hour, every day, from
Pray with me, please. Most Holy Father, we come before your great throne of love, mercy, grace, thanking you for your love, thanking you for the great sacrifice that you made in sending Christ to this world so he could redeem us. Thankful that he loved you and loved us enough to leave his place besides you to come here. Beyond our ability to understand what he gave up in order to come to this earth. We thank you, Father, for your word, for your spirit. For the church our Lord bought with his blood, we pray, Father, that you will bless your children the world over. We especially pray for our congregation that we will be people you want us to be. We pray, Father, for our families who've suffered loss, losses recently, especially this week. Had a family, and godly family. We pray you are blessed and help them as only you can. And Lord, we pray that you will help us to, to help them. We also pray, Father, for the congregation as, as we look at Brother Fisher and Brother King and consider them to men who be elders who lead this congregation. And for us to follow them. We pray, Father, that we will do that. Your will will, your will, will, will be done in whatever happens. We pray, Father, for the Rick as he brings a lesson. We'll bless and help him. We thank you for Brother Jerry as he leads us singing and the men who've taking part in the service so far. We, we thank you for them. And, and Father, we're just so thankful that we're able to assemble as one group again. It is a, I was thinking it seemed like that our absence here makes this day even more special as we see those that we haven't seen for a while. We pray, Father, that we'll carry this love that we have for each other into the world and that those who are not in your body will know who we are by the way we care for one another. Father, we also pray for our leaders in our government, that you will lead them, that you will guide them in a way that they will do what's best for our, for our country. That you will bless them as they do the things that are they're do that are right, and you will defeat them where they try to do things that are contrary to your will. We pray for our men and women who protect us, whether it's in the military or police force or 
those who serve in the medical field, whatever it is. We thank you for those who, who put their lives sometimes at risk to help us. We may not understand how fortunate we are to, to live in a country where we can live as we do, worship you as we want. It's truly a blessing, Father, that I hope that we never take for granted and hope, Father, that we never lose. We pray, Father, that as we go through our lives, that as we have opportunity to teach others, that we'll take that opportunity. We also pray, Father, that as we go through this service, that the things that we do will be pleasing to you that we honor and glorify you and you were strengthened and encouraged by our time here. We have so many things that we'll be thankful for. And we know that all of those gifts come from you and we receive them and can enjoy them because of what our Lord did for us. And it's his holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Song number 250. 250. Those of you who sang tenor and bass, please pick up your parts when you get there, okay? If you're willing and able, would you please be standing? We'll sing the entire song. <clears throat> How I love the great Redeemer Who is doing so much for me With my love I tell the story Of the love that makes them free Till my earthly life is ended I will sing, sing songs of love And beside the crystal sea Praising Jesus and His love, He is everything to me, to me. He is everything to me, and everything shall always be. I will never cease to break a song of gladness in His praise. Here and in the world above, my soul shall sing a saving love. I can lie in joy and the precious friendly for me. He has purchased my redemption. For all the burdens it away, and is walking on beside me, growing nearer day by day. That is why I sing His praises. That is why. That is why. That is why forevermore. I shall sing of the divine. He is everything to me, to me. He is everything to me. And everything shall always be. I will never cease to write a song of the in his break, here and in the pearl of my soul shall sing of saving love. 
Invitation song number 916, 916. That song right there gave me goosebumps on my goosebumps. I hope you could sing that from the heart this morning. It's such a beautiful song. Jerry, thank you. It's so good to have you back leading singing and recovering so well and good to see each and every one of you here especially those that are visiting with us this morning and also those who have been able now to come back as we join back together as one assembly and it's so good to be able to greet each other in, in one assembly rather than being spread apart and I just loved all the visiting that went on it was great to see us reuniting together and getting to talk to family. And that's who we are, is God's family. Might you this morning take your Bibles out, turn to Romans chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7. So look out here, I just rejoice that I'm able to see your presence this morning, as already mentioned, but it's so good. Some of you were not able to get out like Gina for, for a whole year. It's so good to have her back with us. I, I just need her to sit over here on this side, Gina. But that's okay. I'll get used to you right there. And some of, the, some of the others had different places during different assemblies, and now I'm looking out and seeing an entirely different placement of a crowd, which is okay. Appreciate the words of Dan as he prepped us for the Lord's Supper because the resurrection is a significant topic. Without it, you and I would not be here. Without it, you and I would not need to open our Bibles. So I'm thankful that we can do that together. And as we think about the resurrection, there is a power that's involved in the resurrection. Now, this headline appeared actually about a year ago, April 9th, 2020. And I want you to look at it carefully. Resurrection power defeats COVID-19. That was a headline a year ago. Now you might wonder, how could somebody say a year ago that the resurrection power defeats COVID-19? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? Let me share with you something that may be a little hard to read. I'll try to blow it up here. But in September 2019, this prophecy regarding the events we are facing today came through the prophet, or so-called, I shall say, Chuck Pierce. His prophecy was the nations will come to turmoil until Passover. Then again in 2020, Chuck Pierce prophesied, supposedly, there will be a massive plague-like invasion that will test us until Passover. This is 2020. 
He's saying that there's going to be a plague until Passover, which he was talking about last year when, of course, COVID was in motion but had just started. But his prophecy was that it would pass. He also emphasized the importance of focus on the word Passover and what it means to us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Dan did a good job telling us what that means. But it involves what is so important to each and every one of us, that is the resurrection and the power of the resurrection. But unfortunately, when you look at a headline like this that was published a year ago, and as we look backward, we can see that this headline was false. It was not correct. And as Scripture tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that it is a word that the Lord has not spoken. And folks, I can assure you, you didn't read that headline in this book. And we're warned against those who speak as if from God, but speak falsely. In fact, the writer says the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Now, I want you to smile. Because we're going to look at the good news. How many of y'all like good news? I know some of you haven't gotten such a good news through the last week and even before about, about various things. But we're going to talk today about the good news. As Paul writes to the church at Rome, he starts out Paul. He's an apostle, of course, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. And look at verse 2 which he promised before through his prophet in the Holy Scriptures. How many of y'all like promises? Y'all remember when you were little kids? And mom and dad promised? You remember when you said, but you promised. Remember when your kids said, but dad, you promised mom, you promised. What's the expectation? You're going to deliver on that promise. Folks, the good news is God has delivered on his promise. Verse 3, look at what it says. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Over 2,000 years ago, when Jesus hung on that cross, God was in the business of delivering on his promise. And that's such a wonderful thing to think about. Here was a man born of the seed of David who hung on that cross, and then he was buried in that tomb, but he didn't stay there. And that's good news. Look at Romans 1, verse 4. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Can you imagine opening that tomb in there or in that open tomb seeing it empty? Wow. And then hearing the stories, Jesus is resurrected. Hearing the voices of those saying, yes, Jesus was resurrected. And ladies, we remember who was there first, don't we? Great news. Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by the power that rested in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from that dead existence to life. And the word declared is an interesting word, and I hope that uh, this will kind of help you grab an understanding, wrap your mind around it. Because the word declared means to literally mark off or to set the boundaries or to make a determination. And when you read this passage, it tells us that God made a determination, and that's good news. He made a determination that it would be Jesus who would be resurrected from that grave. And that's important for us to understand because as you think about it, and as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3, For I delivered you, Paul said, first of all, that which I received. He's talking about the good news, the gospel. He said that Christ died for our sins. In other words, God laid out the boundaries for the death. And then he goes on. And that he was buried, verse 4, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Those boundaries, according to the Scriptures, were defined. They were laid out for us. 
And folks, no matter what people tell you today, no matter what they might teach or preach, or no matter what they might believe, those boundaries do not move. God put them in place. And that's good news. Because you and I can trust in this message that has come from the Spirit of Holiness. According to the Scriptures, Christ died, He was buried, and resurrected. And thus declared to be the Son of God with power. This word power is also an interesting word in the Scripture. It means power, like it's translated, might, strength, or that which is powerful. And to illustrate, it's the word from which we get the word dynamite. How many of y'all have played with dynamite? Now, when I was a kid, we loved the 4th of July because we'd take all those firecrackers that we could get our hands on and attempt to make dynamite. Any of y'all do that? You take the little ones and you try to make a big one out of it. Never got to play with a real stick of dynamite. That was probably good because we might have killed each other. But we'd try to make it. Because we wanted to see that which was powerful. Well, folks, God's given us something to see, hasn't he? What do we see? We see the words that tell us that the death and the burial and the resurrection is essential to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can be assured that that tomb was empty. It's interesting in Matthew 11, verse 23, we read it translated as mighty works. Folks, God has done some mighty works. Mighty works in bringing a Savior to the world to give man a solution to the problem of his sins and to give him hope. And so that resurrection was extremely powerful, so powerful that it declared with a determination that was prophesied that Jesus would be who he said he would be, the Son of God. And I like the story of Thomas. Y'all remember Thomas, right? You remember he said when the disciples told him in verse 25 of John 20, we have seen the Lord. He said to them, unless I see his hands, and of course, what's he talking about? The prints of the nails. And put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side. I will not believe. Well, after eight days, John 20 verse 26 says his disciples were again inside and Thomas with him. And Jesus came, the doors being shut, stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. And folks, the only source for that true peace rests in the resurrection, Jesus Christ. He was there announcing something they could not obtain for themselves. And you look at their life, their, their life was, had been a struggle because of his death. It almost seems like they gave up hope. But Jesus is a source of great hope, and we'll mention that as we end this lesson. But notice what happens. Verse 27, Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. We could almost have an invitation song with those words, couldn't we? And if you're hungry, you're probably wishing that that was. Do not be unbelieving but believing and it is a continuous action God wants us to continue to be folks who are believing and what gives us assurance that it's worth doing folks the same thing that gave Thomas assurance the reality that Jesus went to the cross and shed his blood for you and I and notice how Thomas answers verse 28 Thomas answered and said to him my Lord and my God Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We have the opportunity because of the power that was demonstrated through the cross and the resurrection to believe and to keep on believing, looking forward to the heaven that God has prepared for us. It's interesting also as we study the scripture that not only did the resurrection have the power to declare Jesus the Son of God, set out his boundaries. But it also, the power of the resurrection had the power to turn the world upside down. We live in a difficult time, just like folks 
then in the first century lived. They were challenged. They struggled also. But interestingly enough, the disciples took to heart the message of the resurrection. And that's why we read those words declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. It goes on in verse 5, Through Him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith. Look at this. Among all nations for His name. I don't know how many nations in the world there are. I don't really know how many were in the first century. But it didn't matter because resurrection was all about all nations. The gospel was to go to the whole world. And when it did, as we read in the first century, it turned their worlds upside down. I love what happened in Thessalonica. When Paul went into the synagogues and he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And he would declare, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And he could do that because of the determination made by God through prophecy and the actions of the cross and the resurrection. That Jesus was who he, that who he preached was the Christ. Now, as you read, there were some folks who didn't like the preaching of that message. And when you drop down to verse 6, they were so angry that when they couldn't grab a hold of the apostles, they grabbed a hold of Jason. They dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here. And folks, as the gospel continued to be preached in the world, folks' world turned upside down. Things changed. And it reached even to the heart of the Roman government, the Caesars. What a wonderful thing to think about that great power of the resurrection. And not only did it turn the world upside down, but in that turn, there is a new proclamation that was made. You can see this in verse 7 as they cry out, Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king. And who is that king? Jesus. How do we know he's king? Because he was declared to be Lord of lords and king of kings. How? Through the power of the resurrection. Because it was declared, it was determined by Almighty God that Jesus would be that king. And truly he stands today as that king. And because he stands as king, we know from the scriptures that the gospel of the burial that follows the death of Jesus and the resurrection has the power to change our lives. And I'm thankful this morning I can look out and see the folks whose lives have changed. You're here and you're worshiping God because of the gospel and the power to change lives. I want to share with, with you something as we move on and we'll bring this lesson to close just in a moment. In Romans 1, verse 6, as you look at that passage, it says, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. That's the Christians. We are called by the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And then in verse 7, he says, to all who are in Rome. And who's he writing to? Christians, beloved of God. And look at this, called to be saints. As you read the New Testament, the saints are the Christians. Those who are called by the gospel. And that is important to understand because a lot of folks don't. And if they were to travel like to Barnes and Noble or some other bookstore or library and sit down and start looking for an answer as to what is a saint, they might get a book like this one, Great Catholic Saints. And all that would do would lead to more confusion. Then they'd be ready to pick up that book, Catholics for Dummies. Now, I would pick the bottom book, Famous Saints for Catholic Kids, simply because it has a lot of pictures. And no offense to Catholics, but they misunderstand the word saints. And who is a saint? In Christ, by the power of the resurrection, by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, you and I have the privilege of being saints. How do I know that? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2 spells it out plainly. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified, that word means set apart, in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. The word saint refers to those who are the holy, 
the set apart, which is what sanctified means, the purified. Now, as you look at the verse, follow it backwards. If you start with the word saint, you see the little blue arrow right here? Hopefully you can see it real well. It goes back to those who are sanctified. Then as you look at the sanctified, it goes back to the church. Folks, if you're a member of the Lord's church, you are a saint called by the gospel. What a glorious and amazing thing to think about. Folks, that puts a smile on my face. It gives goosebumps to my goosebumps, knowing that we have the privilege to be set apart for the service of God. And it all involves the belief of the truth. If you look at 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, Paul writes, We are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Those you can't separate. To which He called you by our gospel. Terry, you're smiling. Because we know the power of the resurrection. Romans 1 verse 7, one other verse. To all in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, look at what's granted. Grace to you and peace. Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You think about our life as walking a road. Ahead of us is going to be a choice if we're not a Christian. We're going to choose either heaven or hell. And one day at the end of the road, if we think about it, we're going to come to an end, that road in this life, and we're going to have a destiny one place or another. And here's the good news. You can put that concept of eternal punishment out of your mind in the sense that because of the power of the resurrection, you have hope. The scripture provides what we need to have hope. And where is it found? It's with Christ. Look at verse 3 of Colossians 3. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. How is that made possible? Because of the truth that we have that Jesus died on that cross and the truth that he's given us on how to live in obedience so that we can have that hope. And folks, if we don't have it, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiful. I don't want to live in a pitiful state. I want to live in hope. And that's a guaranteed hope, right, Clayton? Amen. It's a guaranteed hope if we make the right choice and we make it our choice to live in obedience to the truth, we have assurance of heaven. And that's going to grant us a peace that we don't even comprehend. How is it all possible? Because of the power. The great power of God. Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit or as we think about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. But notice carefully in verse 5, through him we have received grace and apostleship, Paul writes, for obedience to the faith. This morning, here's good news. You can choose obedience to the faith. That is a message that went to all nations. It's the message that it's one worthy of consideration this morning. If you're willing to surrender your life to Christ, be obedient to the truth of the gospel, and to live faithfully, then there's a great hope, a hope of a crown. And it's not difficult. It's just a firm decision. Oh, there's struggle with sin, sure. But we can repent and turn from our sins and have hope because of the blood of Jesus Christ that shed on that cross and was guaranteed by the power of the resurrection. So this question this morning, is the crown going to be yours? If not, if you can't say yes, I live with that hope, then this morning we're going to stand, we're going to sing an invitation song. And if you're here and not yet a Christian, and you understand these steps that we see on the screen, we want to help you to become a Christian. If you need to learn more about it, please let one of us know so we can study with you, so you can learn and know what it takes to become a New Testament Christian. Because you see, we need to be baptized which is in likeness to the death, the burial, and the resurrection.
What's your hope? Are you walking in peace, looking forward to heaven? If not, why not respond to the call of the invitation as we're led in this song of invitation? Would you please come? Pain, nor no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on the happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day, that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day, that will be. Be no sorrows there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there, and forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day, that will be. What a day, that will be. With my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. Please be seated. Go back to that first slide, Kim. Fine. There we go. I'll explain that in just a minute. Uh, Gina, Tracy's come forward. And I know Gina has missed being with us, been unable to be with us for, for the last year. And she's gotten her shots and get out and be with her family once again. And she's missed that terribly. If you had a chance this last year to visit with Gina, you, you know that well. And of course, she's missed y'all. And once that known, of course, and we've missed her terribly. And she asks that she comes forward that we pray for her particularly. And, of course, God would forgive her for anything wrong in her life. But also she wants us to pray on behalf of her with her relationship with her family. She's got some struggles there. And life is a struggle sometimes with various issues, as we all know, particularly those of you who have gone through a very challenging week last week. But I'm so thankful that... Cause of the resurrection and the power of resurrection, we can bow our heads and pray together. So let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity once again to bow together as your people. We acknowledge, Father, you're the great God of heaven and give you thanks for, Father, sending Jesus to die on that cross and to go through that death and then to be resurrected to life. And Father, we're thankful for the hope that we have in Jesus that we can also, Father, live eternally with you. Father, we're mindful at this moment of many that are hurting because of heartache and struggles with illnesses and other things, Father, in their lives. We just pray you be with them. And also, Father, this morning be with Gina. And she's undergoing her challenges, Father, as we all do. Pray, Father, you'll be with her. Give her the comfort of knowing that your forgiveness and 
strength is there for her life, Father. Thank you for your word that can help her and help us to help her as encouragers. Father, we pray that you'll be with her in a relationship with her family. May, Father, that not only be healed, but also provide opportunity for us to teach them the truth of the gospel. Father, we just give you thanks in knowing that we can have comfort in the remission of our sins, that you've promised those who do what you want us to do. I'm thankful for that. Pray, Father, you forgive Jean of anything that's amiss in her life at this time. Father, we thank you for your word and I hope it brings us in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I just want to apologize for just a moment. I, I'm so used to our services being over at 12 o'clock, starting at 11. And when I got up to preach, I thought, i got plenty of time. So please forgive me for that. And uh, apologize for that. Pre appreciate, though, the opportunity to be able to teach and be with you this morning in the study of the Word. I do want to mention this evening. This evening, is we're going to be looking at the lesson, The Dark Side of the Resurrection. So I want to encourage you all to be back here this evening and participate in that study. And for our young people particularly, they'll understand this. Some of us that are older may not. Turn to the next slide there, Kathy. See, there's a dark side of the resurrection, and there's a dark side of life, and we want to be there. And our young people know all about the dark side, don't they? And so tonight we're going to explore that a little bit. So I want to encourage you to be back. Be meeting at 6 o'clock. And Wyatt is leading our singing, I believe. So I'm looking forward to that. And hopefully you'll be here and join us in that uh, opportunity for another fellowship. And once again, we appreciate you being here with us this morning, especially our visitors. We're so happy you're here. I invite you to be back next Lord's Day and, of course, tonight as well. Thank you. The singing sounds so good, I hate to stop, but I guess we will. 898, Paradise Valley. So please be standing, we'll sing the song and have a dismissal prayer. As I travel through life with the trouble and strife, I the glory of hope to give cheer on the way. Send my soul to be your and rest on that shore. For the night has been turned into day. Up in the beautiful paradise valley, by the side of the river of land. Up in the valley, the wonderful valley, will be free from all pain and all strife. There we shall live in the roses in garden, in the shade of the heaven. How I long for the paradise valley, where the beauty of heaven I see. As I roam the hillside, or I lift to the tide, as I pluck the sweet flowers that grow in the a faint picture is there, traveling bright and fair. Where pretty old flowers never fail. Up in the beautiful paradise valley, by the side of the river of love. Up in the valley, the wonderful valley, where we free from all pain and all stress. There we shall be. The rose in garden needs the shade of the evergreen tree. How I long for the paradise garden, where the beauty of Jesus of sea. Though your garden is rare, it is not to compare with the flowers that bloom in the garden of the midst of it grows, shares perfect sweet growth, is a wonderful flower of love. Up in the beautiful paradise valley, by the side of the river of love. Up in the night a wonderful valley, to be graceful, paid and all strong. There we shall live in the rose-tinted garden, in the shade of the 
Out with me as we go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day you've given to us to come together to worship you, study your word, and sing praises to you. We thank you for all the many other blessings that you've given to us. Thank for Rick, the lesson he's brought us this morning. Help us take it to use in our daily lives so we might be better servants for you. Lord, again, we ask your blessing on our sick. We ask that they could be returned to their much wanted health. Lord, we give thanks to you for those who have recovered or recovering from their illnesses. Lord, we also ask your blessing on those families, lost loved ones. Ask, be with them, give them the comfort that they need. Lord, we ask that you guide us as we leave here today. Keep us safe. Guide us in all that we do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>